It's good to be at Willette. I'm not going to take a lot of time to reminisce, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention how special this congregation is to us, and, and we'll never forget uh, the kindness and love that you've shown us, not only with the support during the time we were at the School of Preaching, but since. And we've had uh, some visitors from Willette. Uh, as we've, well, you know, when we moved to Florida, all of a sudden we started getting a lot of visitors. Uh, people stop in and stop by on their way to and from, and, and uh, we're good, glad to see all of you this evening. I, I have exactly 38 minutes to define and defeat one of the most complicated systems of religion that you'll find uh, in the world, and that task is almost unconquerable. Thus, uh, I have, like Rob said, prepared uh, to leave you with things that you can take and that you can study on your own. I, I will be going quickly. I will treat this uh, as a lecture. I tend not to do that on uh, Wednesday nights. There's typically a questions and answers uh, environment where I'll open it up to the classroom. Uh, if there's time providing, uh, I will do that at the end. But this uh, is a little bit different uh, than I typically will do. I will be using mostly manuscript. I will be doing some reading and I'll expose uh, some content and uh, help all of us, hopefully, to understand uh, a system of religion, uh, namely the Seventh-day Adventist system of religion. Now, to begin, I'd like to do some housekeeping. This particular presentation is a, um, a dialogue of a class presentation that I was challenged with while in school. During one of our classes, my, uh, the students uh, randomly chose out of a hat uh, different systems of religion, and I randomly chose this one. And our task was to define it and defeat it. And that uh, was a class, and maybe you're familiar uh, with some of the instructors from different schools of preaching where they allow no fluff, no uh, opinion, just the facts. Just the facts is all we're going to be looking at. Uh, our opinions can be drawn and our opinions can be given. But in this particular case, I think it's important to just understand uh, facts as they are and to be able to give an answer to those that, that may be uh, caught up in, in any system of faith. That's our challenge, is to understand um, different systems of faith so that we can answer them. And it's important also, and, and I've not been here for the other speakers, but I'm certain that the objective is always uh, to be speaking the truth in love. I think it's very critical. Any time that we challenge or any time that we have an opportunity to discuss or any time that we have a, a, an opportunity to study, if your student, if your um, person that you're in dialogue with does not think that you have their best interest in mind, you're spinning your wheels. And... The Bible teaches that our motive is always in love for one another. And so, although at times us preachers uh, tend to get venomous, tend to, to raise our voices, and we, we tend to, to be preachy and speaky and those type things, please understand that, that don't, don't dismiss that passion as not having love for others. Those that are lost need to be found, and we know that uh, helping them um, to be found is a, is a very passionate thing. This is a personal topic for me. I do have family members that are members of the Adventist Church. And this, although was a, a random uh, thing at first, has helped me to, to further dialogue with them. Now, our motivations are to in, are include teaching others through error. That, that was one of my great motivations for becoming a minister. When, um, along with the... the encouragement of the elders at the east side congregation ever since i was a young man I'm, I'm glad to see these young men leading in your service because when i was that age 14 15 16 17 the elders at the church would always say you you need to go to the school of preaching you need to go and preach you've got a good voice you've got this and, and they would encourage me throughout my life to do that and we should encourage one another and that's one of the reasons i do what i do of course, care and love for the loss and encouragement. But one of the top three encouragements for this work that I do, and that I'm sure that most ministers do, is being able to confront error. 
And that's what we're doing here tonight. Now, I'm going to move quickly. And like I said, there's a handout that's provided. And if we have time, there'll be questions and answers at the end. The origin and history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church had its roots in the Millerite movement. And that is in the 1830s or in the 1840s during the period of the Second Great Awakening, as it was called, and was officially founded in 1863. Prominent figures of the church include Hiram Edison, James Springer White, and his wife, Ellen G. White, Joseph Bates, and J.N. Andrews. Over the ensuing decades, the church expanded from its original base in New England, in the New England area, and became an international organization. In 1831, a Baptist convert named William Miller was asked by a ba another Baptist to preach at a congregation or a local church and began to preach about the second advent of Jesus Christ and that that would occur somewhere, somewhere between March of 1843 and March of 1844 based on his loose, I would say, interpretation of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. He did such and convicted many people to follow along. A great following gathered Mr. Miller, and that included many from the Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterian, and Christian connect Connection churches. Uh, he was a very effective speaker and had many converts to his thought process. In the summer of 1844, some of Miller's followers promoted the date, uh, promoted the date of October 22nd. They linked this uh, cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 and the Jewish Day of Atonement, believed to be October 22nd that year. By 1844, 100,000 people were anticipating what Mr. Miller had called a blessed hope. On October 22nd of 1844, many of the believers were up late at night waiting for Christ to return. He was saying that he was coming back that day. As many people, by the way, have said uh, between then and now, there was some bitter disappointment that night when Christ didn't return and sunset came and midnight passed and their expectations went unfulfilled. All the things that he had been saying did not come to pass. And this event later became known as the Great Disappointment. The Great Disappointment. This, these 100,000 people that had followed his teaching and uh, were influenced by Mr. Miller about the, the return of the Christ on that particular date were certainly saddened when it didn't happen. The Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches pre-tribulation premillennialism. Now, if you'd like to try that five times fast, uh, that's a very difficult thing to do. But pre-tribulation, pre-millennialism, um, talks about the fact that Jesus Christ will come back and uh, take his, his uh, people up to heaven with him, and there'll be a time of 1,000 years on this earth uh, without Christ. The Adventist church teaches that. Beginning with um, William Miller's teaching, the Adventists have played a key role in introducing the Bible doctrine of premillennialism in the United States. In his book, The Kingdom of the Cults, which is uh, written by Dr. William Martin, he says, and I quote, From the beginning, Adventists were regarded with grave suspicion by, the great, uh, by a great number uh, of a majority of evangelical Christians principally because the Seventh-day Adventists uh, were premillennial in their teaching. That, that wasn't common uh, back then, and it was, they were a part of a group that taught premillennialism. Certain authors of that time considered premillennialism teachers to be peculiar and uh, dubbed as Adventists, all who held their view of that eschatology. The unique contribution of the Adventist church to premillennialism cannot be overlooked. They are pre-tribulation premillennialists who accept the Bible teaching on the literal 1,000 years in Revelation that immediately follows the literal second coming in Revelation 19. In contrast to all other, almost all other premillennial groups, they do not believe uh, in a thousand year kingdom on earth during that millennium. 
they believe uh, a little bit differently. We'll discuss that in just a moment. In their eschatology, Christ promised to take the saints to his father's house in John 14, 1 through 3. You may recall that passage when Jesus is preparing his disciples and he says, uh, you know, I'm going to, in, in my father's house are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a house. They, they, they promise or they teach the, about this promise uh, it being fulfilled at the second coming where both the living and the dead and saints, the dead saints are taken up in the air to meet the Lord. Now there are some similarities to truth uh, in a lot of what is taught by the Adventist church. That's why it's very important uh, that you study and that you um, be able to delineate and as Brother Jones at the School of Preaching would say, to pick out the bones and to be able to, to delineate the truth from the error. But we see this uh, premillennialist teaching uh, in error in many ways. Instead of a millennial kingdom on earth, Adventists teach that there is only a desolated earth uh, for 1,000 years. And during that time, the saints are in heaven with Christ. Now, they take this from a what I would consider a, a bad interpretation of Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 through 29. Now, I've committed the worst felony that a preacher can make. I have left my Bible somewhere. It's either on the pew or in the car or somewhere. But if you'll make a note of that and read chapter 4 of um, Jeremiah, beginning in verse 23, we see this... this um, uh, picture of a desolate land and the, the context of that teaching is actually um, in Judah and the, the fall uh, of Judah and the, the Babylonian takeover of the Jews in, in Judah. Thank you, Rob. One preacher coming to another's rescue. I bet that's the King James Version too, isn't it? That's good. So turn with me, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 4. Beginning in verse 23. Jeremiah is a different place in your Bible, Rob, than it is mine. You don't have those little tabs that tell you where it is. Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning, this is fine. Did you find mine? Like All right, very good. Uh, see, I'm still a novice. You see that little yellow? <laughs> Check him out. <laughs> I'm still a novice here. I, I use the little tabs. To che we call them cheater tabs. But anyway. Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning in verse uh, 23. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they, were, they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, indeed, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. Furthermore, in verse 27, For thus says the Lord, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. This application of this uh, interpretation of, of Jeremiah chapter 4, I, I contend and, and can fully back with Scripture that is a misapplied application. This prophecy of Jeremiah concerns Judah, and the impending judgment of the southern kingdom and God's outpouring of wrath upon an unrepentant nation. Um, not to belittle or to talk down or, or anything like that, but it doesn't take much study to, to figure that out. And, and you'll see that to be, the, to be consistent, not only uh, in the Adventist point of view, but in other systems of faith, the other systems of religion that you're studying and, and the error that you're, that you're trying to contend with, you'll see often um, something the Bible tells us that we should do is to, what, rightly divide the Bible, right? And to understand the context and the different applications of Bible. And you'll see that, an erroneous um, application of prophecy often in Adventism, and applying uh, different prophecies to future uh, things that will happen when... The, Literally, they've already transpired uh, in the past. Uh, as we go on, Adventist Publishing. They are a, a group, much like the Lord's Church, that does a lot of publishing, a lot of, a lot of uh, promoting and printing. Their publishing works began with a document called The Present Truth. On November 18th, 
Ellen White, this is in 1848, supposedly had a vision uh, in which God told her that her and her husband should start uh, a paper. In 1849, her husband determined to publish this paper and went to find work uh, in order to raise funds to do so. Uh, they sent out the publication, which had the topic of the Sabbath to friends and colleagues, and used that publication, The Present Truth, uh, to evangelize. And um, as far as choosing their name, and we're talking about now the origins. Let's dial it back a little bit and remind the audience that we're talking about origins and the beginnings and the starts of the church. Uh, they chose a name in 1860, a fledgling movement finally settled and uh, on the name Seventh-day Adventists, representative of the church's distinguishing beliefs in the Sabbath, of course. Three years later, on May 21st, 1863, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists was formed, and the movement became an official organization. So if that's on your exam, if that's the test question, when did they become an official organization, that would be at the General Conference in 1863. I contend to you that the Church of Christ and the Lord's Church became an official organization on Pentecost in A.D. 33. And, and the roots and traits of the Lord's Church can be tracked all the way back. Furthermore, their uh, annual regional meetings. Now, some may say that the Lord's Church would have these. Uh, the, the purpose of the meetings that Rob and I and Jack and all the different preachers and their wives and elders and the wives and different people go to uh, typically are for training and encouragement, not to define the doctrine, as many of the meetings that um, are held by denominational uh, outfits are. Their first annual regional camp meeting took place in September of 1868. Since then, uh, since that first meeting, um, this annual regional camp meeting has become a pattern and is still practiced today. They have annual camp meetings. You'll find that a familiar pattern of man-made organizations. They'll have, uh, I think the Baptists will have a, um, a convention or um, uh, the Church of God that uh, a lot of our family are familiar with uh, have um, the um, thing every year that they go to, the assembly uh, or the general assembly they would call it. And used to do the Church of God of Prophecy in Cleveland. Uh, used to have the general assembly there for years. I remember 10,000 or 12,000 from all over the world would come to their general assembly. The influence of Ellen G. White cannot be overlooked when you study the Adventist system of religion. Ellen G. White lived from 1827 to 1915. She held no official role with the church, but was a very dominant personality. She, along with her husband, James White, and Joseph Bates, moved the denomination to concentrate on mission work and health care. Under her guidance and under their guidance, um, in the 1870s, um, the, the key uh, aspect of the church turned toward more mission work, revivals, and they tripled their membership by 1880. Uh, and the rapid growth uh, entailed all the way to the 1900 uh, year when they had 75,000 uh, members. Folks, there are a lot of things that a lot of uh, denominations do well. And one thing that the Adventist church does well is evangelize. They have grown. In 1945, they had 226,000 members in the United States and Canada, 380,000 elsewhere, and they had a $29 million annual budget. Now, they use schools and universities and churches or uh, uh, elementary schools. Uh, my nieces went to, all through a school at a Seventh-day Adventist school. Uh, there's a Seventh-day Adventist University, Southern University in Collegedale, Tennessee. There are, uh, at, this, at this time, in eight, 1945, their enrollment in church schools was 40,000. Now, I don't know how many we have enrolled in, in schools of the Lord's Church. It's a very effective tool uh, to have, and I'm, I'm glad that we have Brotherhood Schools. In 1960, there were 1.2 million members with a, uh, about a $99 million budget. And the enrollment in their colleges and from elementary to college was almost 300,000. Look all the way to 2008. In 2008, 
the global membership was 15 million, nearly 16 million, with a budget of $45 million. And the number of students in the Seventh-day Adventist ran universities, secondary and primary schools was 1.6 million students. That's a lot of people, a big reach, a massive influence uh, on religion today. And the methods that they're using uh, are very effective methods in uh, indoctrination beginning uh, in, in early school ages. As far as the organizational developments, uh, the church, uh, from the early 1860s, the church had three levels of government. Three levels of government. Uh, they had the church level, the local church level, uh, the conference level, and then the general conference level. As conferences developed in far off lands, it became a little out of hand and became more difficult to manage as sometimes that we, I, I'm so glad uh, that the New Testament pattern is that individual congregations are autonomous and, and self-governed. Um, one of the burdens of, of church government um, in the denominational world is outside influence on, on individual congregations and certainly uh, trying to keep everything the same or everything uh, going the way it should. And this this um, got uh, a little big uh, in the 1860s or 1890s. As they developed in far-off lands, it became obvious that the conference uh, could not oversee the day-to-day -day activities of every uh, particular. So they, they divided up into different districts in the United States and had uh, different ways of managing there. And their 1888 general conference which took place in Minneapolis. There was a, a session that involved a discussion uh, between the general conference president, Mr. Butler, and uh, Uriah Smith, and a, and a group, another group led by Wagoner and Jones about the meaning of, quote, righteousness and faith, and the meaning of law in Romans and Galatians. When you teach or when you uh, speak or study uh, with someone of Adventist faith, it is very important to have a clear um, understanding of the word law and, and what it is, where it is, and how it's found in the Scripture. There are many that in that faith that will contend that there's a such thing as a ceremonial law and a moral law. The Bible, my Bible, I, don't, I had Rob's for a minute, and I'm pretty certain that his is the same as mine. Uh, there's no distinction between those two. Uh, but they'll contend that there is. But they had this meeting in the general conference to discuss uh, the differences uh, in that word and how it's found in the Bible. That's very important. Their fundamentalism and progress. In the early 20th centuries, in the early 20th century, they brought some new challenges to their faith. The death of the prophetess, quote unquote, Ellen G. White in 1915 brought some questions about how the church would continue without having what they contend was a living prophet. Adventist leaders participated in a variety of fundamentalist prophetic conferences uh, during and soon after World War I. After she passed away, there was some confusion. In 1919, a Bible conference also had polarizing influences uh, on the Adventist theology with progressives uh, and traditionalists butting heads with each other about how they should proceed. Um, fundamentalism was dominant in the church in the, in the early 20th century. In 1919, a Bible conference took place, and it was a pivotal uh, theological event that looked how Adventists would interpret Bible prophecy and the legacy of Ellen G. White and her writings for the church. Her writings are used uh, quite at length. Um, in, uh, earlier in the 20th century, uh, the edited transcripts of the 1952 Bible Conference were published as Our Firm Foundation. So we have, um, in 1952, a coming together, if you will, of their um, doctrinal uh, pattern. Uh, other systems of religion uh, will have books. Um, the Methodists have, have a book. The Baptists will have a book. And different ones will come together on, in their minds about their system of faith. See that as happening in, in 1952. And that particular publication is called 
our firm foundation. Now, I have no clock. Where is my clock? 15 minutes. Thank you. You need a clock. Clocks are good. Clocks are helpful. No clock. Is that, wait a minute, I hadn't started, no, I hope that hadn't been a big thing here, and I'll just, uh, you know, last week, I know I'm running my time, I know that, but last week we had a guest, and he said, oh, I see a clock, I, and I went back there and took it down, and, and there's a guy that we have, his name's Harry, he, he amens every, everything you say, he went back and he got that clock, and he walked out the back door with it, and I got there Sunday night to preach, and I, Harry never brought the clock back, so anyway, a doctrinal overview. Uh, of the Seventh-day Adventists. I'm sorry. I'm going to chase a rabbit. That's just the way I am. Doctrinal overview. Um, shared Protestant doctrines, which Seventh-day Adventists have, are central doctrines of, the Protestant, of Protestant Christianity. The Trinity, these are shared doctrinal, much like other systems of religion. They agree uh, in these areas. The Trinity, the Incarnation, the Virgin Birth, the Substitution of uh, Atonement, Justification by faith, creation, the second coming, resurrection of the dead, and the last judgment. There are uh, doctrinal things that are very consistent with many other systems of faith. Um, but, and those are all listed. There's a big long paragraph of those in the paperwork that I have. But for sake of time, I want to get to some questions. that um, uh, seventh, Answers to Seventh Adventist questions. And then I want to get uh, to the close where we have uh, uh, how do you um, defeat uh, the, the, the system of religion. Questions. Um, was the Sabbath instituted at creation? Um, this is what they'll say. They'll go to the, the, the Sabbath being instituted at creation. The God, God rested on the seventh day. And many other evangelicals will answer yes because of Genesis 2-3, right? Uh, he saw what he did, he was, he was uh, pleased and well pleased, and uh, he rested on the seventh day, right? But Nehemiah said, the Sabbath was revealed by God to Israel. When? That's an open question to the floor. When was the Sabbath revealed by God to Israel? Anybody know the answer to that question? Mount Sinai, and, and briefly before then. Through Moses and the law of Moses, right? He said in Nehemiah 9, uh, verse 13 and 14, You came down on Mount Sinai. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them the commands through Moses. That's uh, from the book of Nehemiah. If God made the Sabbath known to them at that time, then obviously it had not been binding on them before. Uh, it was law given by Moses on Sinai. The first command to keep the Sabbath in the Bible is listed in Exodus chapter 16, uh, verse 22 through 26. It was given to Israel on Mount Sinai and repeated shortly afterwards in the Ten Commandments. So when they say, well, Genesis 2, that's when the Sabbath was instituted, your answer to that is Nehemiah 9 and uh, Exodus chapter 16 and Exodus chapter 20. Next, Christians must obey the Ten Commandments. You know, that's been a confusing thing. You know, these courthouses and these fights about having the Ten Commandments out there. And you say, well, you know, and then people say, well, you don't, you don't keep the Ten Commandments? Christians are supposed to keep the Ten Commandments, right? Well, certainly we should do all that God commands. But the Ten Commandments were a part of the Old Covenant and the Old Testament that was given, uh, that was given to Israel by God through Moses. Notice the introduction to, uh, to them. And God, this is Exodus 20, in verse 1 and 2, for those of you watching on the internet. Notice the introduction. I am the Lord your God who brought you, listen folks, personal pronouns in your Bible study is important, are important. Okay? The use of language and personal pronouns are important. And, and God's specific audience here are the children of Israel. He says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Exodus 20, verse 1 and 2. Moses summoned all who? Israel, right? And said, oh, hear, O oh, who? Israel. The decrees and laws I declare to your hearing today. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 1. There are specific audiences and contexts, contexts 
and audiences that we find in Scripture. Those are very important in your study. It's misleading to quote the Ten Commandments and leave off the introduction which tells who they were for and who they were to in context. They certainly were to the, to the nation of Israel. But the Sabbath was called perpetual. The King James and, and Revised Standard Version calls them perpetual and to last forever. Anybody got an answer for that one? Forever means as long as the covenant is in place, right? God said to the Israelites, observe the Sabbath. And uh, if you read Exodus 31, it says it will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. And it was, it was a perpetual, forever uh, lasting command to the Israelites as long as that uh, covenant stood in place. Other things were to be uh, kept forever while that covenant was in place. Also, burnt offerings, incense, ceremonial washings, the Passover feast, Passover feast, those proverbial rocks that you can put into people's shoe. If you want to keep, uh, why, how will you how will you say it in East Tennessee? Once you pick that up, you got to keep toting it. If you if you want to keep the Sabbath and keep that part of the law, it was forever and ever. But you no longer do the perpet, per, the the perpetual washings, the ceremonial washings, the incense, the burnt. I don't see a lot of burnt offerings and goats being slaughtered on the stages and altars of the Adventist churches. Um, they'll they'll tell you that that's no longer in place, but the Sabbath is. And the same language is inflicted, and Brother Robbie will be preaching here before long, and, and you're going to hear him use this phrase as it pertains to antiism. He's going to say, that doesn't even make good nonsense. I promise you. And when he says it, you're all going to remember that I said that. But once you say that you stop doing part of the law and pick up and keep doing another part, that doesn't even make good nonsense. Christ kept the Sabbath. Does anybody have the answer for this one? Galatians chapter 4 tells us he was born under the law and kept the law. He certainly, the, the, the new covenant wasn't even in place until when? Until those nails went in his hands and that he rose out of the grave and the Spirit fell at Pentecost. He certainly lived under the law and he kept the old covenant. Paul... This was um, something that, oh brother, this was something that uh, uh, my sister, I love my sister, and we're on very good terms, but this is something my sister just mentioned to me the other day, that Paul kept the Sabbath by going in the synagogues. I contend that he did not keep the Sabbath. He went to where the, the people that had church on their mind was and to, and to convert, and I can prove that. We see that there were many Jews in Jerusalem that obeyed the gospel that were still zealous for the law. And Paul uh, also not only went into the synagogue and reasoned with those people, but he actually took part in some of the, the uh, things that were going on there. And he tells us in 1 Corinthians 9 why he did this. When they say, Paul kept the Sabbath, you have an answer for that. When they say, Jesus kept it, you have an answer for that. When, you say, when they say, Paul kept the Sabbath, he tells you in 1 Corinthians 9 exactly why he did that. Look at these words right here. Where is it? That by all possible means, I might, it's over here, win some. That by all possible means, I might win some. If you look in 1 Corinthians 9 and you start that, to the Jew I became as a Jew. To the Gentile I was that I did anything I had to do to preach the gospel. That's how we need to be. And my elders understand this. If I have the opportunity, if I have the opportunity to speak at the First Baptist Church in Mariana, Florida, guess what? I'm going to go there. And I'm going to, I've got the sermon. Steve Higginbotham preached it. It's perfect for that, for that setting. If I have that opportunity, I'm going there, just like Paul did. Paul going to the synagogue and reasoning righteousness to the Jews that were still keeping some of the ceremonial laws no more makes him a Sabbath keeper than me going there, if I'm invited, makes me a Baptist. Amen. That's exactly what Paul did. He went to convert. 
His motive was conversion. I'm going to skip ahead just a few things because I, I've got maybe a minute. Please refer to the uh, paper. To defeat Adventism, not only you have those questions and answers that I just skipped through, but you have the idea that there are prophecies that's unfulfilled. How do you know if a prophet is true? The Bible tells us that prophecies must be fulfilled. Deuteronomy 18.22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if that thing follow not or not come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. If they say it and it doesn't happen, guess what? They are F-A-L-S-E false. And I'm going to skip through. I promised I was going to go through all of these. I'm going to skip through these, but there I've listed ten that Miss White prophesied that did not come to pass. Most of them considered Jesus coming back. Some of them didn't. But there are ten different prophecies that I have listed on the paperwork, and there are multiple others that did not come to pass. I wish I had more time to go over all these. But these ten that I've listed demonstrate with their failure that she was not a true prophet. The Bible says that there's going to be a lot of people that say a lot of things that aren't true. That doesn't mean that we don't love them. That doesn't mean it's not our obligation as Christians to teach them. But it is our obligation as I... I contend and I applaud this eldership here at Willette in bringing these men and different people in to talk about different systems of religion. I know I've gone fast and I've, I've really left off more than I should, but the conclusion of the matter is the Seventh-day Adventism is a false religion. It's a false religion. They appear to be closely in line with true Christianity. They believe in Christ's deity. They believe in the virgin birth, the Godhead, and etc. Even on their webpage, they teach about salvation through, by grace through faith, which is absolutely true. Their position on baptism is an error. They teach on baptism that it's a sign or a, a symbol of your salvation. It's not to be saved or to, rec to remiss your sins. And many people are, have fallen away to this deception and even accept uh, Seventh-day Adventists as true Christians today. Our charge as we close is to expose error. I want to reiterate what I said at the first. We need to do that in love. We need to do that with proper attitude. We need to, we need to um, do that uh, with the proper attitude and love in our heart. And our objective should be just as Paul's objective was to convert, not to belittle, not to win the argument, but to love one another and bring them to Christ. Pray for me as I study with my family. Pray for each other as we study for others that are caught up in false systems of religion. And do your due diligence, I urge you and challenge you, brethren, to do your due diligence and study to show thyself approved, to be able to give an answer for the hope that is within you. I appreciate your kind attention, and thank you for the opportunity to come back and visit with you again.